Bibles over to Colossians, a prison epistle Paul wrote. And uh, the name of the message today is filled with the knowledge of his will. Filled with the knowledge of his will. It's Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 is where we take all of our messages named after verses that we're looking at. But uh, filled with the knowledge of his will. Colossians 1, 9 is, uh, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So we're going to get into that, talk about that today. We do have an offering box in the back. It's the black box on the wall. We do have people that online that send money. We don't, we don't pass a hat here. We're not looking for money. But you know what? The money is used, like Brian said, to further the gospel of Christ. It's used to pay for the building here. No, no elders. Brian and Kevin are the elders of the church here. And myself, nobody takes a gas, a stipend. No money goes to us. Again, all of it's used. We send money to Haiti. We send money to Cameroon. We send money to Nigeria and Kenya and Tanzania and the Philippines. All for pastors to get buy Bibles because uh, a lot of those places, they don't have access to that. Um, we support the ministries around the world, people that are clear on the gospel. That's what the money is used for. So the black box is up to you. If online, people can mail it in. And uh, they just mail it to 22549 Kangas Road, Bovee, Minnesota, 55709. And again, we record everything. And people, because we're tax exempt, people can use it for tax write-off. Um, our, general, our specific learning outcomes today is pleasing the Lord. What's that look like? You'll get over there to uh, verse 10. We're going to get to it. It says pleasing. All please says of the Lord unto all pleasing. So it's about how do we please the Lord? How do we please our dad? Our dad in heaven. And we'll learn what pleases the Lord. Because if you're a child of God, I think we should know what pleases our dad in heaven. Because it is a family affair. We should know what pleases our dad in heaven. And it talks about today, we're going to talk about being fruitful, pleases our dad, increasing in knowledge, it pleases our dad, strengthened by his might, pleases our dad, patience, pleases our dad, and giving thanks. So that's what we're going to Specific learning outcomes today. So hopefully you would learn something today, leaving church here. But most important, if you're not saved, if you're not trusting Christ alone, if you're trusting in a, a church, uh, a sacrament, a tradition, maybe your own good deeds, that you would listen to the Word of God. Because at the mail, at the jail this week, we talked about two men getting saved. And you know what? We printed, presented the gospel to these men. And you know what one of the men said to me? He says, you know, my mom told me that I should never believe nothing until I see it with my own eyes. And I said, your mom is wise. I said, great. I said, turn your Bibles to, over to John 3.16. We read it. Turn over to Ephesians 29. Read that. I said, so what do you think? He goes, well, I just read that you, it's all by grace and faith. Believe. He goes, I'll believe that right then and there. He trusted Christ as his Savior. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. So if you don't want to believe me, that's fine. Hopefully you would believe the word of God because this is truth. So if there's anything that you get out of the message today, if you're not saved, hopefully today you trust in Christ alone as your Savior. And as a child of God that you would grow in grace. Brian talked a little bit this morning about heaven's a perfect place. Heaven's a perfect place. This is why no church, no one that can reconcile, there's no ritual that can redeem, there's no sacrament that can save, no tradition that can justify, and no work of men that can make you perfect. If you look at the verses that Haley wrote on the wall over the day, you can actually read them today, because when I write them, it's little scribble marks, but Haley wrote them today. If you turn over the Bibles to Revelations 21, 27, mark your Bible in Colossians, because that's the book we're studying, and we will flip over to verses. But if you look over to Revelations 21, 27, one of the last chapters of the Bible there, and it talks a little bit about heaven. It talks a little bit about heaven. It says, and there shall no wise enter in anything that defiles it, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Heaven's a perfect place. But we're not. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I would say, well, that sounds like a lost cause. Heaven's a perfect place. I'm a sinner. I miss the mark of perfection. You know, sounds pretty hopeless. But I would say, this is the good news. Here's the good news. Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. 
Yahshua's salvation, the, the, the anointed one, the Messiah. Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, voluntarily died on the cross for all of your sins. He was buried and resurrected the third day to show you all your sins have been paid in full. And if you would believe that and that alone, trust in Jesus Christ, what he's done for you, he will put the perfection required, he will put the righteousness required to your account. The perfection that's required to get to heaven is freely received in Christ alone. The righteousness that's required to get to heaven is freely received in Christ alone. The reason a person is saved forever is because if there was a possibility, if, if there was a possibility of you losing your salvation, it would be because of sin. But remember, Jesus Christ paid for all sin at the cross of Calvary. Your sin has been paid in full. The reason a person cannot lose their salvation tomorrow or 20 years from now is because Christ paid for that sin also. All of your sin has been paid for at the cross of Calvary. A person is not more saved today or less saved today or more saved tomorrow or less saved tomorrow. The way they live or don't live. Salvation is a one-time event in your life. And it happens if you're born again or not. If you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, at the very second a person believes in Christ alone, they're born again and forever child of God. Once a child of God, forever child of God. As we grow up in Christ, as we mature in Christ, we're not more saved or less saved. We're growing in grace in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Or we're not. The book of Corinthians is written to babes in Christ. Babes, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Babes. They never matured, but they were still saved. So once a child of God, forever child of God, as we grow up in Christ, we mature in Christ. We're not more saved or less saved. We're growing in grace and the knowledge of Christ. Oh, we are not. Some people never, ever grow up, but that's fine. They're still saved. However, we are forever child of God. There might be times when my daughter, Miracle, give you an example, she, she talks to me or does not talk to me. That does not mean make her less or more of a child of mine if we talk or not. If she talks to me, she's my child. If she does not talk to me, she's my child. And that's the same for being born again. How many times does a person need to be physically born to be a child to your parents? One time. One time. How many times does a person need to be spiritually born? One time. One time. You'll never find in the Bible where a person gets unsaved, resaved, unsaved, resaved, ever not become a child, un not become a child, become a child. It's a one-time event. Once saved, always saved. And remember, if it is of grace, it's free. If it's of grace, it's free. And it's eternal. If it's not eternal, that's not grace. If it's not free, that's not grace. Grace is free, and grace is eternal. People that think a person can lose their salvation do not understand the cross of Calvary. Carla and Darren and I had a great, she came away, he came over Friday. We had a, just a great discussion Friday evening. We talked about, but yet people think a person can lose their salvation. They don't understand the cross of Calvary. And Jack hung up a cross over here, and we got a couple on the piano, and we're going to get a couple on the wall here. But they don't understand the cross. They don't understand Christ. And at the end of the day, people that say, you can lose your salvation, they deny that Jesus Christ paid for all sin. And if a person denies that Christ paid for all sin, you're saying he's not God. You're saying that you have to do something for salvation. And that's a false message. That's not the gospel. Christ paid for all sin at the cross of Calvary for all mankind. However, a person has not trusted in Christ alone, they're still condemned. And if you turn your Bible verses over to John 3, 16 through 18, because we're going to look at that real quick here, so you can see it for yourself, because it's all by faith and faith alone. So however, a person has not trusted in Christ alone, they're still condemned. The only way a person is no longer is condemned is when they believe in Christ alone, and they're seen as perfect and righteous as Christ alone. Why? Because it's positional truth like blinds it. You, they're placed into the body of Christ. They're seen as righteous as Christ. They receive the perfection that's required to get to heaven. But if you look at John 3, 16, which everybody knows, yet in the context, Jesus is speaking to a religious man. His name is Nicodemus, and he was a ruler of the Jews. He was a Pharisee, probably memorized the whole Old Testament, at least the first five books, probably. These guys were highly intelligent. 
But Jesus speaking to him says, you must be born again to see the kingdom. You must be born again to enter the kingdom. This man was not saved, even though he was a religious person. And then he goes down into the context of saying in John 3, 16 through 18, and before the verses there, he talks about ultimately in verses 14 and 15, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness in Numbers chapter 21, and how the people were bitten by the snake, and the only way they could be saved is they would look to that brazen pole, and we know brass in the Bible means judgment, and as the serpent was a picture of the foreshadowing of Christ becoming judgment for all of us, how he became sin for every one of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes, it doesn't say water baptized. It doesn't say ask Jesus in your heart. It doesn't say become go to confirmation. It says whoever believes in him should not perish, never go to hell, but have everlasting life. And for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. And yet we have a world today that hates Jesus Christ. They hate the Messiah. They think, you know, he comes to condemn us. Where the fact is we're already condemned. We're born sinners right here. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved because he saves us from a hell that we deserve to a heaven we don't. He that believe on him is not condemned. That's what the word of God says. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. That's good news. That's good news. And I say this to the end. I'm going to say it right now. If you've not seen this, look at this hand right here. This wall, this hand represents you and I. This wall here represents our sin. Actually says sin on it. God loves us for God so loved the world. Hates your sin. Why? Because Isaiah 59 says sin is a barrier between us and us and him. Heaven's a perfect place. God is a holy God. He's a just God. There's got to be a payment for sin. You know, man will say this. Man will say, oh, you know what? Just go to communion, confess your sins to another man. Man will say, you know what? Just, uh, you know, go to confirmation and receive the Holy Spirit, which is a false message. You don't go to, you don't take a class when you're 12, 13 years old for 12 weeks and then receive the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work that way. You don't, you know, walk to the front of the church and make, you know, dedicate your life to Jesus. No. The payment for sin is a blood payment. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. What the Bible says, this is what my Bible says. Let this hand you represent Jesus Christ. He's God from eternity past. He's the ever-present Jesus Christ. And he went to the cross of Calvary and he shed his blood, right there, blood. In 1 Peter 1.18, it says it's the most precious thing, blood. He redeemed us. He died, he buried, he resurrected the third day, showing us the payment for sin. And just like the thief on the cross in Luke chapter 23, Three crosses there. Both of the malefactors on each side of Christ, both of them railed on Christ. They mocked him. They said, if you're the Messiah, why don't you save yourself and get down and save yourself? Well, you know what? He was saving them. And one of them changed their mind right then then and there. And Jesus said, today, thou will be with me in paradise. If you're sitting here today, and if you would believe that Christ died on the, died in your place, his death for your debt, your debt of sin. He was died for you, he was buried for you, and he resurrected for you, and he's freely given you eternal life. And all you have to do is receive it, believe it. For, by, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. One of my favorite verses, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. How great is that? So if you're tending a church that says you must turn from your sin, which today, you know, Billy Graham's grandson, I see it on the news, he's got a three-step three step process for salvation. You know, just turn from your sin, dedicate your life to Jesus, and ask Jesus in your heart, whatever the three. False message. That's not, a, that's not you will not find that in the Bible. People that say you've got to turn from your sin are basically saying you've got to stop being bad. Well, I have a sin nature. That's a fact. We all deserve to die. We all deserve to go to hell. But the good news is Christ did this for us. If you're attending a church that says, surrender your life to Jesus for salvation, they're saying you have to do something good. That's not accurate. That's, not, that's, that's a false message. 
And I say never mix salvation and service. Salvation, the conception when you're born again, is a separate event than service. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, documented in the Scripture soul and alone. So God receives the glory alone. After a person is born again, they're a child of God. They receive Christ as their Savior. They believe the gospel. They trust it in Christ alone, the Son of God, as their only hope to save them from a hell they deserve to a heaven they don't. That's the gospel. After a person is saved, they now are a child of God. Now they grow up in Christ, and they are nourished nourished this is how we feed we're nourished on the bread of life the water of life the milk and meat of the word good stuff so we're going to read in colossians here and my computer just died i don't know what happened oh well it's rebooting. We'll see what happens here in the next 20 seconds. I've never had that happen before. Turn your Bible over to Colossians chapter... Zoom up here. Colossians chapter 1, verse 8. <sighs> Who has declared unto us your love in the Spirit? If you remember in verse 7 there, Epaphras. You see, as you learn of Epaphras, your dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. You see, Epaphras had a love for the people and he had love for people and love is a is ultimately a fruit of the spirit and he demonstrated love by sharing the gospel with the people in verse 7 in verse 8 it says who also declared unto us your love in the spirit the love for all the brothers and sisters in christ stemmed stemmed from the indwelling of the holy spirit we know that Christ promised this in John 14, 16 through 7. He told him that we would be a comfort. A comforter was going to come to us, that we would receive the Holy Spirit. It would give us information. It would have us recall things. But we know the Holy Spirit speaks of Christ. And we know that the Spirit came to the church in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. And we know the fruits of the Spirit. If you look at Galatians 5, 22, the fruits of the Spirit. If you don't want to turn over there, I'll just read it. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. So walking in, the, walking in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit of Christ, just like Epaphras did with Coloss, is sharing the gospel. Walking in the Spirit is praying for other believers. Because you'll see in verse 9 how Paul prayed for them. Walking in the Spirit is forgiving other believers in Christ. We know that Colossians 3.13 says that. That's not, last week we talked a lot about love and forgiveness and things like that. But walking in the Spirit is not having revenge. It's forgiving other brothers and sisters in Christ, as Christ has forgiven us. Be not like the world and think of revenge or getbacks. Walking in the Spirit, because this love that Epaphras had for the church of Colossus in one eight, it was from the Spirit. So I say these fruits of the Spirit, knowing that Christ paid for all sin, my sin, past, present, future, knowing that I'm eternally going to heaven, not because of anything I did, because of what he did for me, that gives me peace. We have two men in the church here today that I know that I talked about before they were saved, they never had peace. They would lay in bed and be fearful because they knew they were going to hell. They knew they were not performing to the religious standard. They were never good enough but when they trusted in Christ alone, they had peace. Knowing that my life is just beginning is an awesome thing. That brings me a lot of joy because if you look at the sign down here, our life is, if you're a believer in Christ, your life is just beginning. Knowing that one day I will be raptured. 
I will receive the rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, not for salvation, no, but for service, yes. Knowing I will attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. Knowing I will not go through the tribulation. Knowing that the tribulation is for the nation Israel, not for the church, not for his bride, not the body of Christ. We will not go through that. Knowing that I will come back and reign with Christ a thousand years here on earth. As a priest, you too, if you're trusting Christ. Our life has just begun. That's what the Bible is written for us. These things we get to look forward to. Isaiah 65, 66 talks about that. Knowing that I will watch the white throne judgment. We talked about this. I will not be a participant, but I will be there. And that will be a sad day because it actually tells us that the Lord will wipe the tears away from our eyes. Why? I think about that often because the lost... My family members, your family members, your friends, they will come up to it because their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life and they will be judged according to their works in Revelation chapter 20 and they will be called cast into the lake of fire which is called the second death which is eternal separation. I will be there not as a participant but I will watch it. My mom and I have talked about that. I pray to God. I, the people that I've met in my life that I, somebody comes there I don't know. I, I think I, that that bothers me sometimes. Because I know I've turned people off in my life. And now they look at me and be like, yeah, right. He's a, he's a believer. I'm, and that, you know, I, I, but that's my own conviction I need to live with. My life does mean something to me today. I don't do things for my salvation. I do things for other people's salvation. Now they, they can see Christ within me. They can know the joy of peace. They can know they have eternal. They, I, you can have eternal life like I know I have. I don't deserve it. But man, man when, when men can come into jail and know they've hit rock bottom and they can know that Christ loves them and paid for every one of their sins and they can know they can go to heaven not by turning their life around but right there, trusting Christ alone. That gives them peace, joy. Man, there's so much that we have to look forward to. But you know what? Like Epaphras here in verse 7, starting the church of Coloss, he had a love for these people. It was spirit-driven, capital S right there in verse 8. Holy Spirit, fruits of the Spirit. We do not produce them. We just bear them. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. I'm going to read verse 9 through 14, and then we'll come back to verse 9. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, with unto all patience, long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Back to verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and wisdom of spiritual understanding. That is the desire. It is the answer for all his children. And that is the answer for all believers. The answer is for all believers to read his word. Read the word of God and be filled with the knowledge of his will, wisdom, and spiritual understanding. That's what verse 9 says. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 10 through 14, this is what the Spirit says does when you read the word of God when you allow the word of God to transform your mind the spirit helps us interpret the word 1 Corinthians 2 10 through 14 says but God hath revealed unto us by his spirit capital S Holy Spirit for the spirit searches all things yeah the deep things of God for what man knoweth the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not to the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. 
We compare spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God, for they're foolish unto him, neither can they know them, because they're spiritually discerned. This is why we have 1,500 different religions of the world, because you have a lost man that will read the Bible, and he will interpret things. And they'll come up with their, their net, they're spiritually discerned. Whereas a gospel-driven church, a spirit-driven, a pastor that's saved, you can go and hear, and you'll hear that same message in Florida, you hear the same message in the Philippines, you'll hear the same message in the Ukraine. You're a sinner. You deserve to go to hell. Christ loved you. He paid for every but all of your sin. He offers you the free, the free gift of eternal life. If you would just believe that, that's a church that is spirit driven. So I say, your dad in heaven has a desire for you. He has a will for you. He has a plan for you. And for you to know the plan, for me to know the plan, you got to know the will of your dad. You got to know the word of your dad. So we hear that Paul here, he prays for his brothers and sisters. They're, we're to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that they would know the will of their father, of dad in heaven. So when we pray for people weekly, we should pray that people would read the word of God, that they would understand the will of their father because it is a family affair. And I say our physical families here on earth will end. We see funerals happening all around us. When the flesh ends, the flesh dies. Some of our physical family members will go to hell and some of our physical family members will go to heaven. Ones that have trusted in Christ alone. I've attended many funerals and people always say, oh, he's looking down for me in heaven. I have no idea. And I go to funerals and never hear the gospel and I'd be like, hmm, I wonder. Because good work saves nobody. If you could be good, then why did Christ die? So I know I have family members, first, second, third, fourth, 15th, 18th cousin, I don't know, but I know some of my family members have not went to heaven. They're in hell today. So some of our physical family members go to hell, some go to heaven. However, if you're a believer in Christ alone, you're forever going to heaven. And with other people that have trusted in Christ alone, that's why we say brothers and sisters of Christ, they're forever going to heaven. And our dad, our father is in heaven. And Jesus Christ, our brother, is in heaven. So we need to pray for our brethren, our brothers and sisters of Christ, that they would get into the word and grow in the knowledge of Christ, grow and they would learn the will of God and grow in the spiritual understanding. Again, just because a person says they're in fellowship does not mean they're in fellowship. That's what First John's all about. It is through reading the word of God, knowing the Holy Spirit speaks of Jesus Christ. When a person bears witness of the love of Christ, that is the gospel. It is the Holy Spirit speaking through us, not us. As a believer, it is our job to grow up in Christ, bear witness of the truth, bear witness of the truth of Christ, which is the love, which is also a fruit of the Spirit. We do not produce that fruit. It is the Holy Spirit that works through us. And I say this, I love that the Lord could use us, use me to share the gospel of Christ, to bear witness of the truth, to bear witness of the love of Christ. I feel it is the highest honor that a child could receive of that of heaven, to be able to share the gospel, to share his truth. Man, if you know what the upper room discourse is, it's John 14 through 16. John 14 there in verse 12, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he also do. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Speaking to the apostles. See, Jesus Christ came. He came to save the lost. He did the work. We are left behind to do something. What is that? to share the gospel with other people so that they could see it, they could hear the love of Christ. Because we're all going to die someday. Where are you going to spend eternity is your choice. It's up to you. Do you believe or not? I would hope, though, I would hope that you have. Born again, receive a new nature. However, we know that growing in grace is learning to yield 
to the indwelling power of the Spirit that lives within us, which is grace living. Growing in grace is reading the Word of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform your minds and not be conformed to the world. Look at verse 10, Colossians 1.10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So when my kids would leave home growing up, I always say, you know what, Zach? You know what, Miracle? When you leave, make us proud. Make us proud. Because you know what? When our son and daughter left the home, they were representing their mom and me. It was bigger than just them. I wanted my kids to know they're representing not themselves, but they were representing their family. The choices they made not only affected them, but affected, reflected their mom and me. That's the same as the child of God. We're here on earth. And there was a time in my life, I looked like I was lost. I wasn't lost. I, I knew where I was going. I, I, I trusted Christ. I believe what he did for me. I knew I had eternal life because I, try, I knew that he paid for all my sins as a young man. But I, will let, I did not live like I was saved. If I would have died... I would have went to heaven. Everybody probably would have attended my funeral and be like, we know where he's at. <laughs> but fact is, I was saved. But the reason I'm, we're left here, and I've come through reading the word, I'm representing something bigger than me anymore. As a, the same as a child of God. As a child of God, we're told that you might walk worthy. Right here, listen, just reading these things, that you would walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing it is a choice as a child of God because I have two natures. I can walk in the flesh and I can fulfill the lust of the flesh or I can walk in the new man and represent my dad with a capital D and my brother with a capital B with honor and integrity. As Christ did the will of the Father, he demonstrated his love. We know that in John 14, 31. He demonstrated his love for the Father by doing the Father's will. And the same for us. It should be our will as we grow in the knowledge of Christ that we demonstrate our love for the Father by doing His will. We got such but a short season here. Short, a short season. We sing the song, you know what, our, we get into our later years and the shadow is long. For some of us are in the winter seasons of our life. Maybe the fall season, we have, we're not guaranteed not one more day But you know what? And I think as a saved man, I'm like, you know what? I'm so thankful that I know where my children are going. I know where my mom and dad are going. I know where my kids, my family. I just, we, what an honor that is. And I have friends that have trusted in Christ alone and become brothers and sisters. That is just so amazing. So as we grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ by reading the word of God, come into church, because we should assemble together with like-minded people. It tells us that. Hebrews chapter 10. We should be here on the Sundays. We should have fellowship like the congregation meeting before church over coffee or after church. People hanging out, having fellowship with each other. We should learn that all that pleases our dad in heaven. That we walk worthy unto him. Do we have to do this? No. Should we do this? Absolutely. I watched a video this week. It was about a young man. He rides dirt bike for the Nitro Circus. If you don't know what Nitro Circus is, it is it's about extreme athletes that live. Just they do all these incredible things with dirt bikes and things like that. But listening to him speak I was immediately saddened because he actually talked about what his biggest fear was, and his biggest fear was not being able to do all the things that he wanted to do. Hmm. Now maybe if you hear that for the first time, you think, well, there's probably nothing wrong with that message. But what I've learned, I've thought about that even, thought about that through the week. What I've learned about the flesh is that once you've accomplished something, there's always something that comes along to replace that old desire for a new desire. And that circle for me never ended. Always being able to do things that I wanted to do. It never ends, never stops. Once I kind of accomplished something, I, you know, it was almost like the anticipation was even better than the event itself. Because when the event happened, I was always felt left down a bit. Then I was looking for the next thing. And what I've come to conclusion in my life is that it's a lie. It's a lie. And never, you'll never stop pursuing what you want to do. It'll just be, next thing will come along. Next thing will come along. And it's a distraction 
for us believers. Because as a child of God, I have lived a life of wanting to accomplish all the things I wanted to do, but later found out it was trying to catch smoke with my hands. It was an impossible task. It was like the jog chasing his tail that you never catch. And you know what? 20 years of chasing the dog's tail over and over and over, what have you really accomplished? I finally came to the conclusion that I need to read the Word of God. And through reading the Word of God, the Lord spoke to me about the will of God and about my dad speaking to me about his will for me. And I have come to the conclusion that my life is bigger than me. I'm representing my dad and brother in heaven in a world that hated Christ, the world that hates God. Yes, there is a world today that loves to be godly, but it hates Jesus Christ. It hates the God of the universe. Because you know why? Matter of fact, when he revealed himself in the flesh, they made lies about him. They said that he was a blasphemous. And I don't understand how you could be blasphemous when you are God. And they say that he's claiming to be God when he really is. And they actually nailed him to the cross. And like Shannon and I were talking before the message today, you know what? The cross to us today is one of the most glorious things you could see on. But it was, you know what? It was, it's a death chamber. It was created for people to suffer. And if you read Psalms 22, and it's a psalm that David wrote a thousand years before Christ went to the cross, and it talked about how he, the joints were pulled, every one of his joints were pulled out of socket, how his heart was melted like wax, how he sweated profusely from the pain. It gives you this picture from the inside of the mind of Christ, what this torture chamber did. And we know that it did to the two criminals. They would break the legs so you could suffocate and ultimately die. But you know what, Christ, he says, you know what, no man takes my life. And I, he says, I will give it up freely and I will take it and I will call it, raise it up again. And it tells us that in, in John chapter 10, 17 and 18. And all ultimately how Christ, they nailed them to the cross. But you know, it is in their ignorance that they fulfilled the scripture and that he paid for every one of our sins. So the world hated him so much. They nailed him to the cross. Yet in their foolishness, they fulfilled the scriptures. I know the world hates me because it hated the Savior. However, that should not stop us. It should motivate us to share the it should motivate us to share the gospel of Christ because we're in a battle. And I've always loved a good battle. I watched the outsiders when I was young, and I talked about the socials and the greasers. And I tell you what, I wanted to be like Derry. If you ever remember the fight where they came and Derry, you know, it's like girl looking at him as a young man. I'm like, oh, that's what I want to do. And I've had some good battles in my life. I got some former football players here. You know, we had some good battles. Good battles in football. But you know, now we come to the realize that we're in a spiritual battle. And I say, you know what? We fight from victory. We fight from victory. We believers have already won. Think about that. Turn over to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Another prison epistle. When Paul was in prison, he, he writes this to the church of Philippi up in Macedonia in Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. It says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be life or Death. I already created my own funeral. Wife has the link. Because right when I die, I want Christ to be magnified. In my life or death, I want Christ to be magnified. I don't care if I live one more day or 20 more years, would it be the desire? But you know what? Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether life or death. To me, that says a lot. For to me, live is Christ. To die is gain. Christ was persecuted on this earth. And we Christians, I tell you, when you start sharing the gospel and tell people there's only one way to heaven, you're going to receive a little bit of persecution. But you know what? To die is gain. Die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I know not. For I am restrained between the two, having the desire to part to be with Christ, which is far better. To be with Christ, far better. 
talked about a man being his feet being amputated, the pain that we go through. I know the men and women of this church, some suffering with, with cancer, some suffering with the depression, whatever it is. Our bodies get old. We get, we start to fall about. To be with Christ is far better. To receive a glorified body. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. We have, if, if it's the Lord's will that we stay here, he doesn't call us home today or call us home tomorrow, it's needful for the people around you. Because there's somebody in your life that's not saved. We need to share the gospel with these people. Our lives in life or death should magnify Christ. Christ is what matters. Christ, the resurrected Savior, that's what matters. As a child of God, we should ask, what pleases our Father? We read it right here. Being fruitful, increasing in the knowledge, strengthened by His power, His patience, and then giving thanks. How do I know this? Let's read verse 10 through 12 again. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and all patience and all long suffering and joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father. So what's being fruitful? You might be asked when you say, well, what does being fruitful mean? And I would say, you know what? Never listen to what I have to say. Listen to the Bible because the Bible always interprets itself. If you look at verse 5 and 6, it tells us what being fruitful is. So you see right there, fruitful being fruitful, verse 10, verse 5 and 6, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel. The gospel is Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, raised again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what the Bible says the gospel is, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. It says, verse 6, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringing forth fruit. As it doth also in you since the day you have heard it and know the grace of God and truth. The gospel brings forth fruit. The Holy Spirit speaks through us about Christ. The Holy Spirit bears witness to Christ. We hear the truth. We believe the truth. We bear witness to the truth to others. We do not produce the truth. It is Christ that lives within us that produces the truth. We just bear witness of it. Let us believers speak the truth. There's not multiple pathways going to heaven. And I say, allow the truth to come through every believer. How do we bear fruit? We do not produce it. A believer bears the fruit. We are the branches, as John 15 says. Branches bear the fruit. The branches do not produce it. Jesus is the truth. He is the root. He's the vine. He's the fruit. The root bears truth. Truth goes up through the branches. The branches just bear the truth. And the truth is, like we said over and over and over, we're sinners. We deserve to go to hell. Christ loved each and every one of us. He's paid for all sin. At the cross of Christ, he said three words. It is finished. To Tetelestai in the Greek. It means it has been finished, it is finished, and will always be finished. He paid for everyone's sins, from Adam to the last man ever living. I don't care who you mention, you can mention the most evil person in the world. Christ paid for every sin for all mankind because we're all sinners. We all miss the mark of perfection. All of us deserve to go to hell. He paid for all of us sin, and he says, You know what? You gotta be perfect to heaven. If you know what, if you believe what I did for you, I'll give you the perfection that's required to get to heaven when you put your faith, believe what I did for you. That's the good good news be fruitful share the gospel of christ because that's what pleases our father that's what it tells us look at verse 11 strengthened by with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joy it pleases our dad in heaven to not live the independent christian life because there's a difference because i tried that it's not living an independent Christian life. It's living a Christ-dependent life. And that is our motto of the church. We're saved by grace through faith, and then we live by grace through faith. It pleases our dad to live a Christ-dependent life. You might ask, well, why do we go through these trials? Why do I go through trials in my life? Man, I tell you what, when things are good, I don't need Jesus it's kind of like, I mean, it's like, oh, and, I, and I'm, I, I, I pray, like, you know, I pray, God, you know, what, if, you, if things get good again, I want to remember you. But I know it's the times when I'm in the trials of my life. It's when I, that I think about him all the time. 
So if you turn over to Romans chapter 5, because this is scriptural, Romans chapter 5, 1 through 5, and you might be like, why am I going through this battle? Why am I going through this, this struggle? And it makes me think of Moses when he leads the Israelites out of Egypt there. You know what? They were in persecution, slaves for 400 years. And you know what? He brings the 10 plagues in and all these plagues were proof to the Egyptian gods. And everyone was a plague against the Egyptian gods that they were false. And finally, the Passover lamb comes in and he appoints ultimately the blood to the doorpost. And that's the picture of the, the, the lamb of Christ. And ultimately, the firstborn killed that night if they didn't have the blood appointed to their account. And ultimately, the Pharaoh says, let him go. And Moses takes a million people out, a million men. And where does he, the Lord lead him? The Lord leads him into a box. Right there against the Red Sea and the people, they could see Pharaoh and all of the, the, the chariots and the people were coming and the people were like, what? Did God deliver us all here to die? And just when you think, things are like, it can't get any worse. And when the Lord reaches over to the light switch and he's turning the lights off and we're like, ah, freaking out. What does God do? He parted the Red Sea. And there's times in our life here that we think, you know, it's like, it can get no worse. And, here's, and we go through these trials because it strengthens our faith. We learn, we learn to not depend on ourselves. But we can depend on him. Because if you read Romans 1 through 5, 1 through 5, it says, therefore being justified by faith. Here, love this, because this is justified. Freed from the penalty of sin. We're justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. By whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand. We have access to his grace by faith. And he gives us so much abundance grace every day. And we access it by faith. Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And here, verse 3, 4, and 5 are the what I want to talk about. Not only so, we, we, but we glory in tribulation. When Paul wrote this to the Romans, we glory in tribulation. I'm like, well, I don't glory in tribulation when I first read this. But now I understand what Paul means when we glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation works patience. Patience works experience, experience, hope, and hopeth make us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which has given us trials in our life, grows our patience on him. It is trials in our life that help us become more dependent on him. It is trials in life that help us live by faith and not by sight. It is trials in life that strengthen us with his might and give us the patience that we need. And it's important that we understand that. And we might not agree with that or wish it was a little different, but again, he's doing these to strengthen us in him, that we become more dependent in him because we know that God ultimately, you know, in life or death, Christ would be magnified. Ultimately, I became his child, and it is his, whatever happens to my life is up to him. If I go through the good or bad, that I would glorify Christ in everything that I do and everybody that would come in contact, that would ultimately be his desire of his children. Because you know what? One day he's coming back. And I'm going to wrap this up here in a few minutes. I get these weird thoughts once in a while. I get these weird thoughts, like the rapture. My wife and I, I'll talk, be like, I wonder if he's strapping his boots up. And I'll get, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But I say this, just because he does not rapture us today, I pray that he comes today, but if, just because he doesn't rapture us today does not mean that our lives don't, do not, does not go on. We do. We press on. We live to another day. We live another day to fight because it is a spiritual battle, Ephesians 6. And I would say with all the world events that are happening, I think the rapture could happen any day. We know the Sanhedrin. These are some interesting facts. Just they're happening. Sanhedrin right now in Jerusalem, in Israel, they're training for animal sacrifices again. The temple will be built. They're going to do that. They already offered animal sacrifices. 
That has not happened since 70 AD when Roman Emperor Titus came and destroyed the animal sacrifices have not happened. And they offered a sacrifice. They're moving, they're getting permission from the Israel government to do daily sacrifice. They haven't got that, but they're getting, they're, they're moving toward that. They already have the altar built. The priest sanctuary is built. And you know what? Some, one of these days, the temple is going to be built. So if you might, you might not want you might not want the rapture to happen. But ultimately, this is what the Bible says. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. We should be looking for him every day. But if he comes not today, we live another day to fight. Because you know what? In John 14, 1 through 3, he tells us, let your heart not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He's coming again. I'm looking up. So here's the weird thought. I know that it's not happening like this, but I often sit there. I can see him in the locker room. You know, he's strapping his boots up and you know, he's getting ready to come. I see Christ sitting in the locker room right now and he's getting prepared to come and get the church, his body, his believers, because one day he's coming. And often I say to my wife, I say, I wonder if he's strapping his boots. I wonder, because it could happen any day. If he returns today, great. If not, great. Either way, let us continue to be fruitful. And I say these things like this. If you have a family member that needs to hear the gospel, Bring them to church. Bring them to church. Good people don't go to heaven. Bad people don't go to hell. Nowhere will you find that. The Bible tells us we're sinners. Send them a link to the message. Write a letter. I just wrote two letters this week. I wrote one to my neurosurgeon, and I'm writing another one. I'm sending letters to people that I know. I want people to hear the gospel. Send a heaven track. Take a heaven track. Back. Send it to somebody. And I say this, if you want me to write a letter, I'll write a letter for you. Email me, I'll write a letter. I just want people to hear the gospel. Let us walk worthy of the Lord, which is bearing fruit, sharing the gospel, increase in the knowledge of Christ, read the word, strengthened by his power through, through trials and tribulations, which then help us grow in grace. Let Christ be magnified in life or death. Let's close in a word of prayer and... Brian and Carrie will close us out with the last song. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we just want to thank you for Christ. We're so thankful that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to the cross of Calvary, to die on the cross, to pay for all of our sins. You were delivered. He would, Romans 4.25 says he was delivered for our offenses and he was raised for our justification freed from the penalty of sin when we believe that he died on the cross for us, was buried, resurrected. We're trusting in him to save us. And Father, if there's anybody online or here that has not trusted in Jesus Christ, just want to give them a second. I'm going to say it to them, you know what? Just like we say in the jail, what's stopping you right now? If you've not trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, what's stopping you right now? Don't be like Felix over in Acts chapter 24, the governor, when Paul went before him, when Paul shared the gospel of Christ, he said, come back. I'm not, I'm not prepared to, to trust in that right now. Well, you know what? You're not guaranteed another day of this life. What's stopping you right now from trusting Jesus Christ right now, believing that he died on the cross for you, was buried for you and resurrected for you? He died in your place. He paid for all of your sins. Right now, you could be like, you know what? I believe that. I believe he died for me, I believe that he died on the cross for my sins, was buried, resurrected. I'm trusting in Christ alone to save me. And Father, you can say, Father, right now you'd be like, Father, because you are born again. You just became a child of God. And Father, to your children here, people faithfully coming out every week before we had the building, not had the building, but we, people are inviting people out. People are joining the family. And Father, we just pray that your children would come out faithfully weekly to hear the word grow in grace. They would find encouragement with each other. They would hear what other people are doing, people sharing tracts, handing out, that we could have fellowship, that we could be encouraged with others and hear what other believers are doing, that people would know that people are getting saved worldwide from the people here. 
that others would want to be part of the family, they can come and join. So, Father, we just pray that you'd be with your children here. Let them grow in grace. They would understand your will, Father, by the word of you. And, Father, we just pray that you'd keep them all safe. You bring us all back next week where we continue to hear your word and grow in grace. Pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We'll have our last song. Oh, elders meeting today. If you have something you want to put uh, in the box, if you have uh, recommendations, you know, or things like that, you can drop in the box and the elders will review it. It doesn't have to be today. You can do that anytime. I just want people to, people to know they have a say. We will hear anything you have to say to the church here. So I'll turn over to Brian. For God so loved the world that it gave his only back to be God's son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So that's awesome.